John 20, starting at verse 1. So it says here, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. And Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you crying? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Or weeping, rather. Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that He had said these things to her. Why are you weeping? She was asked twice by the angels and then by Jesus. Why are you weeping? Well, John goes to great lengths to try to prove to us that Jesus really did rise from the dead here. He gives us a lot of details that try to prove this and drive that home. So, John gives us many reasons to believe Jesus truly did arose from the dead. So, for example, three people saw the tomb empty. Three people. And in the Old Testament, there's something significant. It says everything must be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. We have three witnesses here. So, this has been a properly established even according to Jewish law. Two or three witnesses. And then in verse 6 there, it says, Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there. So the linen was left behind. That's weird. If you're a grave robber, you want to get in there and get out real fast. You don't want to take the time to unwrap the body with all of the linens that are around it. So the linen was left behind. That's actually kind of expensive, the linen stuff there. So why would you leave that behind if you were a grave robber? So again, another reason to say he really did rise from the dead. In verse 7, It says the face cloth was folded up nicely. Again, if you were a grave robber, why would that be folded up nicely like that? You wouldn't take the time to do that. It's almost almost as if Jesus got up and didn't need these old clothes anymore. He's clothed with heavenly clothing. And he has this face cloth around him, so he just takes it off and folds it up nice, sets it down, and goes on his way. 
There's a lot of proofs here. So there's an early church father who even noticed this, who said, if anyone had removed the body, he would not have stripped it first, nor would he have taken the trouble to remove and roll up the napkin and put it in a place by itself. Not to mention how costly some of these things were. If you were a grave robber, these would be the things you'd be going after. But that question, why are you weeping, that was asked twice to her. Why are you weeping? Well, Mary was weeping because she thought the body was taken. She thought somebody stole the body. Now, grave robbers were rare, not unheard of, but um, unlikely. There were actually laws in place so that any grave robbers would face capital punishment if they had robbed a grave or disturbed a grave even. So this is a very serious thing. Burial is something that's very important. But not necessarily grave robbers either. She might have thought that the authorities came and took his body away. Usually if you're crucified, your body is thrown into this mass grave for just anybody. You know, you're crucified to try to put down a rebellion in everything that you stand for. And so they don't really want you to be buried in any special place. They throw you in some mass grave with a bunch of others and, and then nobody would be able to mourn you very well. So she might have thought that the authorities came, saw that he was in this really nice tomb, and thought, no, this isn't happening. We're going to put him somewhere else where he's not going to be able to be remembered very well. So that was, that was a real possibility. Crucifixion victims were enemies of the state, not people that you would want to put in some nice, big, fancy tomb. Burial is a basic human dignity afforded even to enemies. And this was something that was especially important to them back then. If you read through the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, that burial is talked about a lot. Having a proper burial is very important to them. There is, there is a lot of honor and respect that was connected to a proper burial. People had thoughts that a proper burial means a better afterlife. There was a lot of thought about that. But especially for Jews, this is very important because they believed in a resurrection. Even to this day, Whenever there's a terrorist bombing in Israel and you know a bomb goes off, you know, people get blown to bits. Whenever there's a terrorist bombing in Israel, there are a special group of people, let's see what they're called, the, the Zaka people. And they go into that bombing scene and they take all of the pieces of all of the people who died to do their best to try to give everybody a proper burial. They actually look at the DNA of all of the different pieces that they find so that they can try to get people together as best they can. And they even do it with the bomber. They even assemble the bomber's body and give the bomber a proper burial because they assume that judgment is left to God. So having a proper burial is so important especially to Jews, that they even do it for their enemies. So when Jesus' body is taken, his, his grave is desecrated, he's not going to have a proper burial, this is devastating. This is something you do even for your enemies. And so Mary, this is, this is even worse than Jesus being crucified. Because if you're killed, you at least have some memory people can remember you and mourn you properly. But if there's no, no body, no grave, then you can't be properly mourned or remembered. No matter what happened, the body was gone and could not properly be mourned. They can't remember him very well. They can't properly say their goodbyes. And in Jewish culture, you, there was like a seven-day mourning period even still, too. 
So people are prevented from bestowing their final acts of, of love and concern. This is a big deal. Mary is devastated. And for obvious reasons. And then in verse 14, it says that Mary didn't recognize Jesus. She didn't recognize Him at first. Which is pretty astonishing because she'd been with Him night and day for years. You know, she was traveling with the apostles. There, there was a whole group of people. It wasn't just the twelve. And they were going with Jesus all over the place. And they heard Him talk. They saw Him do miracles. He was the, the greatest thing that ever happened to them. It's kind of surprising that she wouldn't recognize Him right away. Now, in fairness, the last time she saw Him, He was very badly beaten, crucified. It says in Isaiah 52, His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and His form beyond that of the children of mankind. They, being crucified is, a, is an ugly business. But one thing that we can see out of this here though, she didn't recognize Him at first, the resurrection body, the same body that we will rise with one day, this is a regular body. She saw it and just thought it was another person. It was a regular, a regular body, a regular person. It's mistakable for an ordinary body. And later in other passages, it can be touched. They touched Jesus. I mean, it says, Jesus said to her here, you know, please stop touching me. The way it's worded actually sounds like she was holding on to him. And he said, okay, it's, it's time to let go now. I, I still have to ascend yet. It wasn't a don't touch me kind of a thing. So it can be touched and it can eat. In Luke, it says that they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it in their presence to demonstrate that he had a real body. Our new bodies... One day when all of our bodies come out of our graves too, we'll be able to eat. We'll have regular bodies. And Jesus' body was beaten to a pulp. Jesus' mutilated body was fully restored. It was fully restored. She didn't recognize Him. It's like, this is, this is not the Jesus I saw last. It was fully restored and fully functioning. It's like it never happened. He was ne like he was never crucified at all, except for the nail marks in his hands. But he was alive and fine. In the same way, our resurrected bodies will be fully functioning bodies. The ailments that we have now, the problems that we have now, the things that hold us back now, any incompleteness or lack of wholeness in our bodies now, will be gone. Our bodies will be completely restored, no matter what happens to us now. So it doesn't matter what happens to us. And for that matter, it doesn't matter whether we go down to the grave whole or not. If, if we were snorkeling in the ocean and got eaten by a shark, our bodies would be fully restored. It doesn't matter what happens to us. Our bodies are going to rise again. And they're going to rise not just like the bodies we had. They're going to rise completely whole. It doesn't matter what happens to our bodies now. Because they will be perfected, perfected bodies later. Look at the screen here with me. And let's answer this together. How does Christ's resurrection benefit us? First, by His resurrection, He has overcome death so that He might make a share in the righteousness He won for us by His death. Second, by His power, we too are already now resurrected to a new life. Third, Christ's resurrection is a guarantee of our glorious resurrection. So it's a guarantee. It's going to happen. When Christ rose from the dead, it's like, it's like popping a balloon and all of the people that were held in death are now going to be released. It's going to happen. 
So Mary, back to Mary. It says she thought he was the gardener. She thought he was the gardener because she didn't anticipate a resurrection. That wasn't on her mind. She wasn't thinking about, oh, yeah, in three days he's going to rise again. I mean, you know, when we celebrate or remember Good Friday, you know, we think, okay, in, in a couple of days it's going to be Easter and we're going to celebrate the resurrection. It's going to be all good. All right, we know the end of the story. It's all right. But she wasn't thinking that. In fact, none of the disciples were thinking that. You know, it says this beloved disciple here that he saw and believed, but nobody really had this on their minds. Because it even says there, they didn't understand from Scripture that he had to rise from the dead. It's, they still didn't put that together yet. To those who don't believe, even to this day, Jesus will only be just a gardener. Just, just a guy. If you, if you don't believe in the resurrection, you, you probably think, well, Mary probably saw somebody who may have looked like Jesus, and, and they, she probably just thought he was a gardener and went and told everybody, that, oh, he rose from the dead, and, but it probably really didn't happen. You know, if, if you don't believe, you probably would still think that she saw a gardener, and that's it. But to those who do believe, if you believe this. Mary saw the gardener of Eden. Not just, not just her Savior, but the one who made the first garden. It says in the Bible that through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So he wasn't just a gardener, he was the gardener. Adam and Eve were made in the garden and they fell in the garden. Death entered this world in a garden and death is overcome in the garden and sin was overcome in a garden too. So is Jesus to you today, is He just a gardener? Or is He the gardener of Eden? And then in verse 16, Jesus calls her by her name. This is one of those places in the Bible where I kind of wish we would have had an audio recording or a video recording of what happened. Because I'd like to know how Jesus said her name. Did he, did he, did he say, Mary? Like that? Like, don't, don't you recognize me? Or did he say it more like, Mary? It's me. How did he say that? I, I, I would have liked to know that. What was the tone of his voice? It says a little before in this same gospel that he calls his own sheep by name and they hear him and they follow him. They know his voice. I also wonder, how, how many seconds elapsed before she responded? You know, when he says Mary... How long did it take for her? Was it like instantaneous? Or was it a couple seconds? This is one of those times when I kind of wish that, would, kind of wish we would have had more of the experience of what was it like to actually be there right then. Rabboni is how she responds. A few weeks ago now, we talked about one of Jesus' words from the cross and how they were recorded in Aramaic. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And those were recorded in Aramaic in both Matthew and Mark. In other words, it was probably such a memorable, awful cry of anguish that they had to record it in the original language because it was just so terrible to hear. But they record her reaction in Aramaic too. Rabboni. Her response is in the original language to mark the indescribable joy that she felt and how she said that. That would have been so memorable as well. 
to go from the depths of despair, not only is your Savior dead, your Lord dead, but He has been, he's been stolen. His body is gone. To, oh, not only is He found, but He's alive. What a, what a contrast. As Jesus' words of forsakenness are written in, as the most bitter cry, her words are recorded in the original as the most exuberant joy, going from the depths of despair to indescribable joy. Easter means our weeping will turn to joy. Not just Mary's, not just that day. It means our weeping will turn to joy as well. Jesus said on the night before, on the night he was betrayed, he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. He said it ahead of time. Your sorrow will turn to joy. And I don't think he was talking just to them at that time. He's, t- he's talking to all of his followers there. Your sorrow will turn to joy to joy because his resurrection is not just for him it's for all who belong to him as well and this is why we have all of these flowers here on Easter morning because we anticipate our sorrow and the loss of loved ones all of these loved ones that are all those names on that sheet in your bulletin that all of that sorrow for all of that loss is going to turn to joy For all those times when we would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's going to be a time when we are going to say, Rabboni, teacher, our Lord. So Mary's sorrow was real, but there was no need for it anymore. Jesus' body, she thought it was stolen. It wasn't. It wasn't stolen or misplaced. Not only that, Jesus wasn't dead anymore. Now you'll notice that Jesus doesn't say, stop crying. He doesn't invalidate what she's going through because she was going through some really serious sorrow there for obvious reasons. He doesn't say, stop crying. But He comforts her with reassurance of what is actually happening here. There's a lot going on there that is similar for our sorrows today. For believers now, our sorrows are real, but they have been overcome. We will be sad today and in our lives in this time on earth. There's a lot of terrible things that happen, and we shouldn't underestimate or diminish how awful those things can be. There are terrible tragedies. There are terrible injustices that happen. And we can be sorrowful about that. But we don't need to be. It's not demanded of us. Because the losses that we experience now are overcome. And they're overcome even now. To the point where when we remember... Christ's death on Good Friday, we know that He's going to rise again. So we can be sad and somber on Good Friday, and that's legitimate. We don't have to rejoice on Good Friday. We can be somber and be serious because of what has happened. But we know what's coming. And so for our sorrows and our troubles today, it's the same thing. They've been overcome. There is an Easter coming. Now, we can still be sorrowful now, and there is some true sorrow to be had. But they are overcome. It's overcome. Because one day, any time we would have said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We are going to say, like Mary, Rabboni, teacher. So why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? As I was studying for this passage, I came across something I didn't know before. 
the three times that weeping and crying is mentioned here is the same word that it's mentioned in another work of John that's also in our Bible. The weeping of verses 11, 13, and 15 is the same word that's in Revelation 21.4. The same one. In Revelation 21.4 it says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall be mourning or crying nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So when Jesus says, why are you crying? We have this to look forward to, because all of this crying, all of this weeping, is one day going to be no more. All of those tears are going to be wiped away. That might be difficult to imagine. But that's what it says. On Easter, we celebrate that because that means that this is going to be ours. And not just maybe, not just hopefully, but definitely. Easter means we will rise to a new world with no weeping. No more weeping again. Jesus truly arose. He truly did. And we truly will rise too. Just as surely as He did, we surely will. And Mary's weeping was turned to joy. And as surely as hers was turned to joy, so will ours be also. And we can move forward confidently that even though we are sad, we have that joy coming. Let's go forward in this joy of Easter. This day and always. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord God, our Father in heaven, You are the one who makes life out of death and joy out of sorrow. So Lord, we rejoice this day. Even though, Lord, our hearts may be heavy, we may have troubles, we may have sorrows. Lord, we go forward knowing that one day they will be turned to joy and that all tears will be wiped away. So Lord, we celebrate Your victory over death and sin and all sorrow this day. In Jesus' name, amen.